Welcome to Life in the God Lane. My name's Tom West. Hope you'll subscribe to my channel. Uh, give me a thumbs up, make comments, and um, share this video with someone else. Could be very uh, impactful to their life. I call this message Storm the Gates of Hell. And it's, it's from uh, it's two passages, uh, Matthew 16, 13 through 18, and Mark 6, 6 through 13. Let's take a moment and pray and ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, we come into your presence. We do it with worship and praise and adoration. We pray that, uh, I pray that you would get inside our life with the truth of your word, make our hearts different, change us, mold us into what you would have us be from the inside out, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today in America, about 29% of the population say they never attend worship, while 24% of the population say they attend services weekly. Now, those statistics include religious affiliations of all kinds, of absolutely every kind. Um, and what, what I wonder about is, I wonder how many people in the United States are what I would call a Christ follower, somebody who's committed to the Lordship of Christ? And that's a tricky question and, and one whose answer is probably not knowable. Going to church uh, no more makes you a Christ follower than going into the Ford garage makes you a Mustang. You know, I, so how do we figure out how many people are Christ followers? I don't know, but I doubt if 10% of the population are really followers of Jesus Christ as Lord. So what's the solution to the lack of com Christian commitment in the United States of America? What's the solution? We look to Jesus for the solution. We'll go to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There, my friends, is a mouthful. Jesus gives us the answer we're looking for. Let me unwind it for you. Having arrived in the, the area of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus questioned his disciples about who he was. He asked about who people said that he was. And the disciples told him that people said, some people said he was John the Baptist. Some people said he was Elijah, some Jeremiah, maybe one of the other prophets of the Old Testament. Next, Jesus wanted to know who his disciples said that he was. Peter jumped right on that answer and he got it right. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus made it clear that Simon, the son of Jonah was right. And then he renamed him. He named him Peter, which means rock. And he made it clear that he would build his church on this rock. He named Peter rock because he confessed Jesus to be the Christ, the son of the living God. And the person of Christ as the Messiah, the son of the living God, is the rock that he would build his church on. Not Peter, but on the confession of Jesus to be the Christ the son of the living God, the reality of the person of Jesus is what Jesus would build his church on. Notice, and this is big, notice who the church belongs to. It's Jesus' church. He says it's his church. He bought it with blood. It is his personal possession. Notice who will build the church. Jesus will build the church. Jesus will build it. It's his, he will build it. Why isn't the church doing what Jesus said it would do? It's, why is it not taking the American culture? Most people involved in church in America 
think the following. They think it's their church. That's how people think. The real trick is to turn ownership of the church over to Jesus and allow him to own it. And it's voluntary. He doesn't impose it. It's voluntary. He bought it with blood on the cross. It's his church. We need to surrender ourselves and the church, which is the assembled people of God, to Jesus. I've seen two churches owned by Jesus for a short time. And when they were owned by Jesus, they stormed the gates of hell. And a bunch of people came to the Lord and the church expanded. It got bigger because people were coming to Christ. What happens, though, is that the congregation or the board of elders or the board of elders and deacons or the church council or the denomination outvotes Jesus and takes over. Sometimes the pastor outvotes Jesus and takes over. Wrong, wrong on all fronts. Not their church, it's Jesus' church. He paid the price for it. No one else did. The church is not a democracy. It is a theocracy, a rule by God. We volunteer for that rule, that rule. And when we volunteer for the rule of God, the church does what it's supposed to do, but not until. It's Jesus' church. He needs to rule it and run it. And when he does, he'll build it. It is the nature of the human condition to take control of things and not get let God own what he owns. Faith surrenders ownership to Jesus. That's what real faith does. And when Jesus owns what is his, he will use his people, the church, to storm the gates of hell and take people for Christ. And that of their own free will, it's never imposed. Now I want to look at Mark chapter 6, verses 6 through 13. And we'll see Jesus operating in his physical life here on earth and storming the gates of hell. We'll see how he did it. We can learn from it. Look at Mark chapter 6, verses 6 through 13. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. And then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. We find out what Jesus did when he was here. And he it has to do with him using himself and other people to storm the gates of hell. First, Jesus had been teaching in the synagogue in his hometown in Nazareth. And the people in his hometown rejected Jesus and downgraded him to just another guy from Nazareth. And he was astonished at their lack of faith. Bottom line, they wouldn't listen to Jesus. So he did something else. What did Jesus do? He left and he went around teaching from village to village. The first thing Jesus did is that he found people who would listen to him. When someone didn't listen, he went out and found someone who would. If someone won't listen to your message, go find someone who will listen to your message. So how do you find people who will listen to your message? Well, you ask God for people who will listen and keep talking to people until someone listens. That's what Jesus did. That's exactly what he did. You know, I sold Fords for just short of 14 years and started doing that in March of 2005. And you got to find people who listen to you before you can sell them a Ford. And so started selling Fords in March 2005 after 30 years in full-time ministry. So how do you find customers? Well, I talked to people until I found someone who would listen to me. That's how you start out. I spent almost all my time on the lot. Sometimes I would... Uh, wait for people to drive in. Sometimes I would take phone calls. They called them phone pops yeah, from customers. And the way it worked where I worked was the receptionist would take a phone call, an incoming call, 
And if they wanted a salesperson, she would announce available sales, call the operator. And whoever got to the operator first got the sales call. I learned how to get to the operator really quick. And I got there before anybody else did sometimes. And I found people who would listen to what I had to say. Now, the first, I started selling in March 2005, kind of figured out what I was doing. And in 2006 was the first full year that I spent selling cars. I, I got a bunch of people to listen on those phone calls and I sold 75 cars that year off of sales calls. Sometimes I would walk the lot for hours until I found someone to talk to and I found them. So in 2006, my first complete year in auto sales, average sales, a car salesman in the country sells about eight vehicles a month. Well, in 2006, I sold 12.16 sold 146 vehicles that year. And a lot of them by just walking around until I found someone who would listen to me and started talking to them. I earned twice the income I'd ever made in ministry. And I simply found people to talk to. Like Jesus, we need to decide to find people to talk to about him so we can share the good news with them. We just need to find them, ask for them, and keep talking to people until some you find someone who'll talk to you about the Lord. Notice that in verse 7, Jesus sent the 12 out, and he, gave, he sent them out in groups of two, and he gave them authority over evil spirits. Notice that he sent them out in groups of two, so they weren't alone. And remember what Jesus called them to, to start with. In Mark 1, 17, Jesus called the two fishermen brothers, Simon and Andrew, and he used these words. He said, come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. From the beginning, Jesus called these 12 men to be fishers of men, to be those who would reach out to lost people with good news about Jesus Christ and bring them into Jesus' fold, into his church, into his group of people so that they could know God and be saved. Remember that Jesus prepared them to do this work by watching him do it, observing him do it, by teaching them how to do it, and then having debriefing times where he kind of brought the lessons home to them. Back in 1976, I was in youth ministry in Southern California, and in, in those days, we had events for the youth to bring their, their non-Christian friends to. And, and then we would go call on those kids. I'd go call on those kids, with, and I'd take a, a couple of youth with me when I did it. And I was teaching them how to do what I was doing. I trained the youth how to do the calls. One night, and this is one of the most memorable nights in my life, I sent three of my guys out with calls for them to make by themselves. You know, they were old enough to drive. They were gone for almost three hours, and I was sitting at the church waiting for them to come back. When they got back, they told me one kid was not home, but they caught the other two at home and they had studies with the other two guys and the other two guys were scheduled to be baptized into Christ on Sunday. Wow, these guys got the message. They took what I trained them to do and went out and led people to the Lord. So do what Jesus did and get other people involved in reaching out to people who need Jesus. And you know what? Jesus did that with 12 guys, okay? And it's been a couple thousand years now. And what he started with 12 people, what he trained them to do has passed, been passed on and on and on. And it's still going on. And people are still being led to the Lord by people who've been trained by others to reach others. We got to get others involved. Jesus sent them out with a sense of urgency. He told them to take nothing for the journey no bread, no money, don't take an extra tunic, stay with someone in town who'll give you hospitality and stay with them until it's time to leave town. If someone won't listen to your message, shake the dust off your feet and move on and find someone who will listen to your message. They were to treat the mission with urgency and with passion. Additionally, they were to approach it with absolute trust in God. Now compare this urgency and this passion with today's, and I call this, let's have church next Sunday mentality. Let's have a church service next Sunday. That's, that's not what Jesus called us to. He called us to reach a world for Christ. The call of Jesus, the same for us today. How do we reach a lost and dying world? Not with complacency, just having church 
services next week, but we need passion and we need urgency to reach the lost at any cost. And the church needs to find that passion and that urgency. Remember what Jesus paid for this. He paid his blood and his life to reach lost people. We need to find his passion and his urgency to reach the lost like he did. We'd storm the gates of hell like he did. Jesus sent them out to preach that people should repent. That's kind of the core of the message. And he gave them authority to do miracles, to confirm the message and grab people's attention. They cast out demons. They anointed the sick with oil so that they could be healed. And that confirmed the message of Christ with miracles, wonders, and signs. Those miracles, wonders, and signs still confirm the message today. They're part of the historical account that we find in the scripture that confirm that message. And you know what else? If God up and decides to, he can still do some of those miracles today to confirm that his, that his message is for real. The core of the message they were called to proclaim is to repent. To repent means change your mind and change the direction of your life. You were running the show in your own life. You were the person in charge, TPIC, the person in charge was you. And you change your mind and you cha choose to change the direction of your life by surrendering it to Jesus and letting him be in charge. He gets to run the show as Lord in your life. Jesus started this whole gospel of Mark out by defining repentance. He said in Mark 1 verse 15, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Kingdom of God is the rule of Jesus from the inside as Lord. And you get into it right by repenting, turning to him as Lord, from running it yourself to him running it, and believe in the good news. The message is always about repenting and believing the good news. You change your mind, change the direction of your life by surrendering to Jesus as Lord and believe that he died to pay for your sin and that payment is complete and that he was raised from the dead to defeat sin and death in your life once and for all. Jesus stormed the gates of hell. He found someone to listen. Second, he got others involved, taking that message to people who would listen. And third, the mission was urgent. It was an urgent thing. And fourth, it was about preaching repentance so that people could turn their life over to Christ and be saved by him and be transformed from the inside out. And I want to go back to Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus said, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. A better way to maybe to say the gates of Hades will not overcome it would be to say in the gates of Hades, listen to this, will not prove stronger than it. The picture that a lot of times Christians will get of this, and it's a, it's a distorted picture, it's wrong. The picture that people sometimes get is, is, uh, is twisted just a little bit. They get the idea that the church is sitting behind the gates, sitting behind the wall, and the assault of hell is not able to get to the church. That's the picture people get, but it's exactly 180 degrees out of phase. The picture is of the church assaulting the gates of hell with the gospel, and the gates of hell cannot, cannot stand against the assault of the church. That is the church bringing the good news to people who will listen and seeing those people come to Christ. So it comes down to this, turn the church over to Jesus who bought it with his blood. He owns it and he will lead the assault that the gates of hell cannot withstand. When his people decide to be urgent about preaching the gospel to the whole world so that they can come to Jesus, then and only then, Will our world and this nation come to Christ? And that is needed more than anything, anywhere, ever, at any time. So turn the, the church over to Jesus, and he will lead to storm the gates of hell. Let's pray. 
Father, we come into your presence. We cry out to you for your church to turn herself over to you. And then I know that you will use your people to storm the gates of hell and reach as many people as can be reached for your cause. I know what's going on around the world needs to go on in this country with intensity. So we cry out to you to intervene, to move, cause the church to get it right. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening. Hope you will uh, be looking next week for uh, the next message that I'll put out, which I call the solution to guilt. I'll roll that out next week about on, on Friday. And every day I'll have a short uh, little quick message that I call the power verse or verses for the day. I'll put that out the night before for the, for the day coming. Hope you'll be looking for those things. Hope they're encouraging to you and that you just walk with Jesus. So I will see you uh, each day and then next week for the main message. Bless your heart. Have a great week.